independence, etc., from individual organizations in our cultural community. And remember, this is all nonprofit arts and culture, so this is not about the for-profit businesses. This is just the nonprofit businesses. And we reached out to about 166 organizations. We got feedback from 87. Uh, and Randy tells me that's better than average to be over 50%, so that's good. Uh, but think, if everyone had participate, participated, where these numbers might be. We also did audience surveys, and uh, we collected about 900 of them. We sent those up to Americans for the Arts. They have a process where they make sure that they are validated. And as you can see from this number, uh, about 40 of them were kicked out for whatever reasons, I don't know. So this study data is based on those 867 surveys that were collected. Uh, here's where we surveyed. We were very thoughtful with the help of our committee to pick four um, free events, paid events, events in different parts of the communities, uh, events that were tourist focused, events that were local focused. So we had a real nice mix of uh, locations and events where we went and actually did the survey. Uh, surveying was done by a variety of volunteers. We had some volunteers, for example, who went out to Meadowgrass. Uh, Lord knows Dot Lishik and her staff at uh, the World Arena and the Pikes Peak Center did an amazing job of, of surveying uh, when we were at, at events there. But we also had a secret weapon. And that secret weapon was the students from the Thomas uh, McLaren School, and I think Joy Orham is here somewhere, who was our coordinator for the students. So we had students volunteer to go to certain events that were appropriate for them, and we, <laughs> not all events were student friendly. Uh, we had uh, each time we had a volunteer, we made a twenty-five dollar donation to the school's band fund. So at the end of the day, we made a. Survey without those extra pairs of hands. And as you can see, this was a, a shot that was taken, I think it was at a, one of the uh, Philharmonic events at the Pikes Peak Center. They were working the clipboards and uh, making it happen there. So we really appreciate that. Today's visit, uh, Randy is here this morning. We are going to, he came in last night, we had dinner with him. We're going to run him through a number of events today uh, where he's going to talk with other folks from the community about this study. And we wouldn't have been able to bring Randy out if it weren't for these partners. Of course, El Paso County uh, government, uh, the B. Brainberg Foundation, Downtown Partnership, Colorado Springs CBB, the Chamber of EDC, Colorado College, who is uh, generously hosting us here today, and we put Randy up at the Mining Exchange and they gave us a good price. So let's thank all of our sponsors. <laughs> and I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that today is the B. Brainberg Foundation's 15th exclusively as B. Bradenburg Foundation does, and none that do it with more passion or enthusiasm for this arts community. So uh, personally, I want to thank David Siegel for uh, being a, a wonderful representative there. And I know we have several board members from the B. Bradenburg Foundation, Susan Libby, I don't know who else is here. Thank you all for all you do to support the arts community. Is a member of our board. I know Andrew's here. We couldn't have done that. Uh, such a beautiful job with us. Thank you. Uh, is on our board as well, and she's helped with uh, PR. We heard some amazing uh, jazz music from Alan Joseph this morning. The video you're about to see uh, was created by Springs TV. Mike Cock is doing our event photography, and of course, uh, CC and their uh, staff, Jeff Hartman and his uh, AV team, have been wonderful. So thank you all for that. <laughs> and uh, of course, none of this happens without a passionate and dedicated staff and board of directors. So I'd like to ask Angela, Jonathan, and Melissa, uh, the newest, newest member of our team, to stand and please be acknowledged. <laughs> and uh, I can also ask all of our board members, I know the president of the board, Brenda Spears, here along with a number of our Board members, if you would stand, please, and also be And of course, none of this means anything if it wasn't for all the art.
artists, the arts organizations, and the arts patrons in our community who support arts and culture, who make arts and culture. You guys are the real heroes of the day. So please give yourself a And now, if uh, we can get the AV to work, uh, they set it all up. It was working before. We'll see if I screwed up. Uh, we asked Springs TV to do a special a video for us, uh, and they just did an outstanding job, I think. And so I'd like to run and debut that video for you now. We will, uh, of course, post it uh, on social media. I encourage you to share it. This is a video we hope will stick around for a couple years because uh, it really speaks to the survey and will help people to understand why it's important. So uh, let's see if we can make that work. When you hear live music, watch a performance, or see great art, how does it make you feel? I think that there's this intangible essence of the arts and any creative culture that is undeniably unexplainable. And so when you have something that people can put their finger on, whether it's a number or whether it's um, percentages or trends, it helps us to tell a story. And what a story we have to tell. Arts and Economic Prosperity is a study that's done every five years to measure the economic impact of arts and culture in our two county region. The report itself is very comprehensive. There's lots of good data in there that you, if you choose to drill down and get into specifics, but then there's also those high level numbers that say that our community has a $153.3 million economic impact uh, as far as arts and culture goes. I mean, that's powerful. That's a big number. That big number puts all of these images and the emotion that goes along with them into critical perspective. It gets us away from just those meaningless phrases of, you know, the arts uh, create community, which it does. But if you just say that, it's just, uh, you know, that's like saying the sky is blue, flowers are beautiful. Everybody <laughs> be happy. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
county commissioners who, oops, not him, him. <laughs> Stan Vanderwerf has uh, been a great supporter of the cultural office. He's a passionate uh, leader in our community. He's, he understands the arts are important. And so please join me in welcoming Commissioner Vanderwerf. Randy Cohen, who is the Vice President at Americans for the Arts, and for those of you who don't know, 
Americans for the Arts is the umbrella organization that uh, across the country supports arts and culture and supports the local arts agencies and organizations that are doing the work of arts in this uh, great nation. Uh, Randy, I've known uh, for a number of years. Uh, we've shared dinner uh, on occasion at, at various uh, Americans for the Arts events. He is doing uh, what he calls the On the Road to Prosperity Tour, which means he's going from community to community to community, talking about the national study, but also talking about the local study. So Randy's going to give us some more insight into uh, what he's uh, discovered as the leader of this survey for the past five times it's been done. He knows his way around this uh, block for sure. So please join me in welcoming Randy Cohen. so excited about coming to town uh, to talk about it, um, about Arts and Economic Prosperity 5. And you, you've heard about the study, you've heard about the importance of creativity and innovation, uh, but we're really, now we've got some numbers to underscore that story, underscore that message. And um, what we're going to do today is change the conversation about the arts, from one of charity to one of industry an industry that supports jobs and generates government revenue and is the cornerstone. And of course, also provides these cultural benefits and cultural enrichments. Why we all got into the arts, right? And, you know, I always start with the fundamental value of the arts. They inspire us, they delight us, they bring us joy, they engage us with the community. Um, the arts create the communities that we want to live in and that we want to work in. But the fact is, it's also an industry. It's business. So I want to stipulate those um, fundamental benefits and, and, again, really challenge everybody to think about the arts a little differently as a business. Now, the arts um, have been a fundamental component of our communities for a long time. Uh, and actually, as evidence of that, I give you, uh, well, here's Exhibit A. So uh, what you're looking at, um, this is a, a flute that was found in a cave by some anthropologists several years ago. And you can see it's sort of this beautiful uh, uh, piece of work. It's hand carved from animal bone, and um, you know, it's got uh, a, somebody got the guts eventually to uh, you know blow some air through it that sounded right. But the anthropologists figured out that this flute was thirty-five thousand years old. You know, they were in, they found it in a cave. They were studying past civilizations. They were hoping, you know, maybe we'll find a spoon or a bowl. How did these people eat? Or boy, wouldn't a blockbuster be, you know, some kind of cave painting or something? Well, instead, um, this is what they found. But what was interesting in reading the article about this, and it was in the Journal of Science, this was a big discovery, they were trying to figure out what was the purpose of this flute. They thought, well, maybe it was to help promote territorial expansion or to celebrate the hunt, or, you know, the, or for the fertility ritual, something like that. I kept thinking, maybe they like the way it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I never showed up. Uh, but you know, the other point was, you know, the art's fundamental to who we are as people, to our communities, to our societies. Obviously, it gave us the great pickup line, my cave or your cave, <laughs> which is what we're doing today. So, um, art's fundamental to our society for a long time. Now, fast forward 35,000 years, and we find the shame flute. Now, this little dude, this is from the 1700s, and it was made out of cast iron, and this round part was sort of clasped around a person's neck, and the fingers were shackled to this long iron tube. The purpose of the shame flute was to punish bad musicians. <laughs> That's right. You got a gig at the prince's palace, and you stake up the joint, well, they march you around town for a couple of days wearing the shame flute so everybody can laugh at the bad musician. <laughs> Sounds a little barbaric, right? But hey, they care about the music. So <laughs> we'll give them that. Anyway, art's fundamental to our society, fundamental to who we are. And we're going to stipulate all those benefits and now talk about the arts as an industry. 
So as you heard, Arts and Economic Prosperity 5, an economic impact study of nonprofit arts and culture organizations and their audiences. Now, um, national study, we're at 341 study regions across the country. Uh, did I get my dot right there? Um, uh, there we are. See, that, did you like that technology? That was all me, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, uh, 341 communities across the, uh, across the country, all 50 states. We had communities as small as, well, Chris, 1,500 people, all the way up to 4 million people. So the bottom line is, it doesn't matter if you're in a big or large urban city, in a small rural community, in a, a suburban community, if the arts are happening there, if there's audiences there, there is an economic impact to that. Now, we focus only on the nonprofit arts and culture sector, or also maybe a municipal organization, if that's part of the local ecology. Some people ask, well, why, why is that? Why not, you know, what about Broadway and motion picture and individual artists? Obviously, all a fundamental part of the cultural ecology in every community. But when um, you know, when the county and the city and our foundations uh, make contributions to the arts, those dollars are typically going to nonprofit arts and cultural organizations. And it's an appropriate question to ask. Well, in addition to quality of life, what's the ROI? What's the community getting? What else is the community getting as a result of that investment? And so that's why we just draw a really specific box. Uh, around it. A little later in the presentation, I'll expand the frame for you a little bit and you can see just you know, how much uh, creative and arts vitality there is right here in the region as well as across the country. But that's what we focus on, just the non-profits. Um, you heard uh, from Andy, we surveyed 166 organizations in the two-county region, El Paso to to the counties. Um, thank you to all the respondents. 87 responses, excellent response rate, feel great about the data. And then the event-related spending piece, 867 audience intercept surveys. Love the picture of, uh, of our students and the volunteers uh, doing those surveys. Um, and then, uh, so what do you do with all that data? How do you turn that into economic impact? Well, uh, we work with a team of economists from Georgia Tech School of Economics and they customize what's called an input-output analysis model for every community that we study. And what that does is, um, imagine your worst calculus nightmare. That's what these things do with the drugs, right? You know, it looks at how spending by organizations and individuals travel through a community, and, um, and so spending by the arts organizations themselves has an economic impact, but so does that dollar as it ripples throughout a community and is re-spent. You know, a theater company, I used to run a theater company, buy that five gallon bucket of paint from the hardware store for a hundred bucks. Okay, measurable economic impact there, but the benefit doesn't stop there because the owner of that hardware store uses some of the hundred bucks to pay the clerk that sold the gallon of paint. And the clerk goes to the grocery store and buys some food, the uh, grocery store pays the butcher, and eventually that dollar leaks out of the community, no longer has a local economic impact. But um, these models, measure each of those re-expenditures and each of the impacts of, of, of each of those ripples. And so this is community-wide impact. That's the beauty of this. This isn't just the arts talking about itself again. This is the arts talking about a community-wide impact. It takes a million calculations in our model that customize right here uh, to come up with these economic findings. All right, so spending by, you know, how does that turn into economic impact? Well, just a quick story. So um, I actually got to go to an arts event recently. Uh, you know, you think of Americans for the Arts and the business card, and I'm getting out to the arts all the time. I wish I had as much trouble getting out the door as the next guy. But um, it was a date night with my wife, and uh, we were going to see a dance performance. Uh, it's a season tango. Uh, I'm a new empty nester now at home, and so we took it up all the time. So now I'm all uh, yeah, might not be impressed. Proud, but not impressed. But we're good. Um, anyway, so uh, normally we're heading out to the theater, but this, uh, we're going to go see the dance performance. So what do we do? We went home, we found that knew what we were going to look for, we went online, found the right event, punch in our credit card number, and, you know, print out the ticket. We were all set. So it was two Fridays from then. And um, date night came, and uh, I got home from work. I was informed to be dressing up uh, for date night this week. And uh, so there was a new necktie waiting for me. So the, you know, the night date didn't even begin. There was already some retail spending involved. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so 
time goes to be time, and off we went. And on the way to the theater, we stopped and had dinner, right? Isn't that something we do a lot? Dinner and a show, you know? And um, went to a nice restaurant, spent $75, had a great meal, and uh, from there, it was off to the theater, parked in a parking garage next door, pulled off my 10 bucks, got my little <laughs> ticket from the attendant, and then into the auditorium itself, and beautiful historic theater uh, near where we live. And, um, got our program, sat in the audience at the, at the beautiful theater, the beautiful chandeliers, and read about the dancers and the dance performance uh, uh, we were about to see. So, pause right there. It's only five minutes to nine, right? I'm to eight. You know, the, the show hasn't even started yet. But, think about all the industries that have already been touched related to this one date night uh, at the arts. Um, you know, it started two weeks before when we went online and, and, and uh, to buy our tickets. Arts organizations, they employ web designers and computer programmers, and the folks who are involved in the, you know, the e-commerce, you know, they're seeing some benefit out of that as well. The banks, you know, they get a little bit of a, a couple of, you know, uh, pennies out of that transaction. And then, um, I don't know actually where she got the time, but uh, somebody benefited from that. And it was off to the restaurant. We spent $75. I was one of those farm to fork places, and so everything's grown within 50 miles. So some of that money's going to those local growers and producers. And the waiter who waited on us, bring home some uh, personal income, the owner of the restaurant, entrepreneurial income, and then off to the parking garage. 10 bucks, it's a municipally owned garage. So that city, you know, 10 bucks every time, and the attendant there is, you know, that's a, that's a job. Um, into the auditorium itself. Even here for an economic impact study presentation, we're giving you paper. This is what we do. We give people so many paper and programs, and uh, someone's got to write that stuff, and designers have to design it, and printers print it. You know what, if all the arts organizations get together and add up their printing bills, and then go present that uh, factoid to the Chamber of Commerce and the Rotary, and say, you know, who are the printers? Millions of dollars in printing spent, you know, by arts organizations. Uh, so there's, you know, there's that uh, benefit. And then sitting in the, you know, in the beautiful theater, um, you know, like I said, I used to run a those beautiful chandeliers, not interns changing those light bulbs. You know, you need electricians to get up there. So all kinds of other industries are touched uh, and are part of the arts. And now the curtain goes up, you know, the dance begins. That's when most people start to think about the arts as an industry. Oh, well, I guess those dancers are getting paid a little bit, maybe, and uh, you know, I was a choreographer and all that type of thing. So that whole experience, spending by the arts organizations, and letting people know, look, arts employ more than artists and curators and musicians. They employ accountants and auditors and marketers and uh, you know management, engineers and electricians and plumbers on down the line. People just don't think about this. It's just not an intuitive way to think about the arts. And we're here to bring the numbers and wake that uh, wake folks up with that message. So all right, we good? This is what we're doing. Um, so what did we find out? Uh, you know, so again, we surveyed the organizations um, and we surveyed the audiences. 153.3 million dollar industry. 153.3 million dollars of economic activity, and that's composed of two figures, as you can see. Spending by the organizations themselves, 51.2 million dollars. That's a mythbuster for a lot of people. We worry about our bottom lines all the time. We're pinching every penny we can. But the fact is, most people don't realize we employ people locally in the community. We purchase goods and services from neighboring businesses. We're members of the Chamber of Commerce. We'll be at the Chamber of Commerce at 3 o'clock today talking about this. And you know we're involved in tourism and marketing and promoting the region. So arts organizations, good business citizens. And it leverages uh, the additional spending by arts audiences here, $102.1 million. What's the economic impact of that? Well, jobs. Uh, Councilman Stan had to leave, but I can tell you, you talk to any legislator and ask them what their three priorities are, jobs, jobs, and jobs. You know what? So we're connecting what we do to what's important to them. Jobs, 5,070 jobs supported in the two-county region. And even in a global economy, these are local jobs. You know, when we go see a concert, you know, or a symphony, or a philharmonic, we're not going to be happy if it's a first, you know, first violin edition of you know, 99 Macintosh computers. You know, the you know, technology doesn't economize you know, our product. We're labor-intensive, 
locally employed, local employment. I always say, arts, not just food for the soul, but put the food on the table for 5,070 households right here in the Pikes Peak region. That's a good whistle. Government revenue, right? Uh, you know what? Uh, these government, these legislators, yeah, most of them love the arts, but you know, how do you pay for these things as well as roads and bridges and everything else? An investment in the arts is not a black hole. That money doesn't just disappear <laughs> into a, a black hole of goodness or a public good. It's giving back to the community, including government revenue. $15.9 million to local and state government revenue. So you can't say this is some kind of drain. Um, you know, and it's interesting, in Washington anyway, um, you know, there's some kind of some pressure on uh, the charitable deduction. Uh, it's, the folks have backed off it a little bit, but, you know, there's a faction of people who think, you know, maybe we should cap the charitable deduction, or maybe arts and culture shouldn't be part of that, because it's this one-way street. We just keep pouring money in. Uh, that we don't get anything back. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Fact is, uh, federal, state, local governments contribute about $5 billion in the aggregate to the arts. Total federal, state, local government revenue, $27.5 billion. Small investment, big return. So that's, a, that's another great news story. All right, millions, billions, let's bring it down to a per person unit. This is, this is really fabulous data. So remember, we surveyed 867 attendees, beautiful labor samples statistically, a range of events. And we asked those folks, how much did you spend related to this arts event? And you know, you saw the people sitting on their bench, writing in their numbers and everything, and we have this picture up there. The typical attendee to a nonprofit arts and cultural event, uh, $34.92 per person per event, not including the cost of admission. So this is beyond admission. And you can see how this breaks down, right? You know, there's meals and snacks. I hate giving numbers. We re ran these twice. Just to <laughs> sure it wasn't twenty dollars and one cent, but it was twenty dollars. Um, it's twenty dollars. Now you know, and there was our dinner, right? Souvenirs. That was my necktie. And here's my apartment. Some might be looking at lodging. Wow, you still get a room for two dollars and <laughs> And would you want to? You could. <laughs> um, so now remember, these are just averages. And we'll hit, you know, but only only a percentage of people have an overnight cost. Um, nationally, we did 212,000 audience intercept surveys. Huge number. And so the other category starts to get really interesting. Um, so my favorite other category, love to tell this, uh, was from Wisconsin. And it was a farmer who paid somebody $60 to milk his cows so he could go to the fair. Mm. I love that story. So, uh, you know, the point of this is, the real takeaway here is, yes, the arts are businesses, they have an economic impact, but no surprise, every industry has an economic impact. I could give anyone in this room a $5 bill and my Georgia Tech economist will follow you around and, you know, see what you do with it and plug that into his numbers and give you an economic impact of that. But very few industries generate the kind of event-related spending that the arts do. And that's the big takeaway here. You know, it's not just our organizations, it's, it's, that, it's that activity that happens with all of these businesses. Now, in addition to how much did you spend, we also asked everybody for their zip code. Because we want to find out, do they live in the county in which the arts event took place, which would make them local, or are they from or the two-county region, actually, right? So uh, El Paso and Teller County. If you live in the two-county region, you're local. If you're outside the two-county region, you're non-local. And what do we find out? 17% of attendees travel from outside the two-county region. So this is a huge footprint, uh, these two counties. So you know what? People really got to travel to get here. Uh, so that, that impressed me. Um, but then the question is, well, all right, does their spending differ? Absolutely. Look at this. $64.23 per person per event, not including the cost of admission um, by our non-local attendees. So huge figure. Nationally, that non-local attendee, $47.57. Uh, so we're doing well ahead for the national average. Actually, in fact, um, this $34.92, that national number, $31.47. So that's another area, actually, we're ahead of the curve here. 
Pikes Peak region. I think a big part of that is because uh, we've got a good percentage of people coming from outside the region, and they're spending a lot of money. Now, it's great, people are here, but what got them here? Why are they here? And so we asked them, we asked those non-local attendees, why are you here? You hear a business, you hear visiting friends and family. 73% said, we came specifically for this arts event. So now you can really see the pulling power that the arts have of uh, bringing people to the community, and those people are spending money. But we asked another question. We asked the folks, probably everybody here, the audiences who live in the two-county region, a question which was, well, let's say this arts event wasn't taking place. Would you have stayed home, done something else? 45% said, oh, we travel somewhere else to attend a similar kind of arts event. So isn't that interesting? Arts, it's a discretionary expenditure. You can spend it here, you can spend it there, you can spend it not at all. And so what we see is that when we invest in the arts, we're investing in an industry, in a product that draws people to the community, those people spend money. Not only that, we're keeping our neighbors and their hard-won discretionary dollars right here in town. That's why we say, you know, a vibrant arts community is good for local merchants. And, you know, you talk to restaurateurs, I do with city to city, they all, hey, they have the same line, you know, everything was learned in the restaurant school. You know, um, I don't need to check the weekend section to see if there's a great exhibition or a cool performance or, you know, festival happening. I can see it in my business. It's cheeks and seats, you know, or dairy uh, ears and tap in chairs. Is a city <laughs> to me. Um, so, uh, lots of economic activity. One more thing about those non-local attendees. So remember, we're reducing the base. The 87 organizations have just those 87 organizations, 3 million attendees, 17% of those folks from outside the region, and 19% uh, of those people had an overnight expense. Their average is $140 per person per event. So you get that head in the bed, you know, that's when the cash registers really start ringing. So if you're an economic development person, if you're a tourism person, you are gobbling up these data. Because what we're doing is we're pulling money into the community. This is economic development, folks. Good? All right. Um, one other thing uh, about this uh, survey real quick. So the 87 responding organizations, this is one of the statistics I love. We also asked about volunteerism. And does those organizations, 4,555 volunteers that uh, give over 297,000 hours per year. Huge. The, the citizen army, you know, it's, it's, it's our volunteers in our community help deliver this economic impact to the community. You can actually put a value on this. The independent sector puts the value of the uh, average dollar, uh, well, dollar value of the average hour at $22.56. So you can calculate that. So $7 million of value. That's not part of the 153.3. It's a really good story to tell, and one I love. All right, um, Washington, D.C. It's always so good to get out of Washington. <laughs> you know, a place where nobody's covered by the facts anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's an interesting place, though. Uh, it's the land of national organizations. There's so many national organizations in Washington, D.C. There's a national organization for the national organization. <laughs> Maybe not. But you can actually make this work for you. So what you're looking at up here are some of the national partner organizations uh, that are part of this study. And if you go into the uh, Copper website, you'll see their full report. We got a little pamphlet today, but their full report's online. Um, and go right to the back of the report, uh, because this is as important as the numbers, honestly. And you'll see these organizations. And so you've got organizations like uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors. That's where all the big city mayors go to meet uh, twice a year. Two weeks ago, they all met in Miami. One of the things on their agenda, they passed a resolution unanimously touting the importance of arts and economic prosperity and encouraging mayors across the country to invest in the arts, to improve quality of life, and for the economic benefits. So you go, yeah, that's great. Great to see you here on that video. And when you go and share this report, remember to flip it over and say, you know, your national organization is a national partner on this. Uh, the National Association of Counties, right here. I'm actually going to see Stan next 
uh, maybe it's two weeks, I think, uh, will be in Columbus, Ohio. That's where all the county managers and all the county council people get together to talk about the big county issues. And I'll be talking to, uh, you know, 1,900 county uh, leaders, giving them the important message as well. Um, you know, you've got your state leaders, current state legislators, Destination International, that's where all the tourism and uh, uh, destination marketing people go. Um, how about the private sector, Council on Foundations, independent sector, you know, their national partners, the business community, the conference board, that's the national organization for the Fortune 1000 companies in this country. These organizations are national partners in arts and economic prosperity because A, they too believe the arts have a fundamental role in building a healthy community. And two, they buy into the methodology, they buy into the results. Trust me, if they thought this thing was going to stink down the road, you know, they don't get anywhere near it, right? So when you go and you talk to your elected leaders and your city manager right there, uh, and your business leaders, and you talk about the economic importance of the arts, remember to look to the back side and say, you know what, we're not just making this up, folks. Your national organization is a partner on this as well. So uh, it's really, you know, we do that to help boost the credibility uh, of your message. All right. Our community leaders get it. You know what's interesting over the years, more and more, now the public gets it. Last year, I did a huge public opinion survey of the arts, 3,000 interviews across the country, one of the biggest ever conducted. No surprise, 87% of the population said, yeah, the arts improve quality of life. What did surprise me, 82% of the population says the arts are important to local businesses and good for the local economy. So that's a really interesting story as well. So you know, we're seeing that the public gets it also. So that's arts and economic prosperity. Economic impact of nonprofit arts and culture industry. It shows that when we invest in the arts, we're not investing in a frill or just some kind of, you know, more gruel please charity. We're investing in an industry that supports jobs, generates government revenue, and is a cornerstone of tourism. So now I want to expand the lens a little bit beyond just the nonprofits, because I know we've got some, uh, uh, you know, other businesses here. We've got publishing and advertising here, uh, you know, design folks in the room as well. And so let's talk about that. But first, let's talk about a World War II tank. Uh, yeah, where's it going with this, right? Um, yeah, that actually is a World War II era tank. But uh, you know what? That's actually an inflatable tank uh, right here on the left. That, this tank is a product of the 23rd Special Troops Unit in World War II, uh, nicknamed the Ghost Army. Mm -hmm. So, all right, turn back your clock, uh, you know, uh, to the 1940s and to the, you know, the war in Europe. And it was touch and go. The United States military was thinking, you know what, we we, we got to get any edge we can get, you know, to, to get through this thing. And so they thought, there was a way to confound the enemy a little bit. Uh, throw them off the scent a little bit. Well, that might help. So, what did they do? They turned to the artists. They went and they pulled artists and designers and actors and technicians out of the art schools in the United States and brought them over there and said, we need you to create diversions to throw off the enemy. And they did over 20 very complex battlefield diversions. Um, they, uh, they had actors sitting in, um, uh, in bars or restaurants that were known to be frequented by enemy spies. Sure, you know, maybe having drunk a little too much and talking just a little too loud about, well, Patton's bringing 10,000 tanks down to wherever. No, we've never been listened to. Well, uh, it was very effective. One of the U.S. generals credits the 23rd was saving 10,000 American lives during the Rhine War battle because it peeled off this huge portion of the German, German army that went to chase down the inflatable tanks. <laughs> so, you know, um, Art Payne, Ellsworth Kelly, you know, so many of the great artists uh, from the World War II area, members of the 23rd. The point is, if you can use creativity and innovation, and you know, you heard uh, uh, Stan talk about that, in a World War II battlefield, man, we can sure do it here in Colorado Springs. Right? You know, and, and so that's that's the message here. So let's talk a little bit about arts and creativity. And we are absolutely in a creative region. This is a study I did looking at not just the nonprofit, but also for-profit arts businesses. Nonprofit leaders, museums, but you know, all of us we talk about, but film, no, architecture, design, publishing, businesses involved in the creation or the distribution of the arts. And I use as my data source Dun and Bradstreet. 
And it's the, they're the most comprehensive and trusted source for business information in the United States. They track 18 and a half million businesses, and they code them all so you know really exactly what they do. And so we thought, well, let's see how many arts businesses are there. So we pulled out all the arts businesses, nationally, 703,000 of them. And that's 3.9% of, of all the businesses uh, in this country. But what's cool is I can drill down uh, on these data by any political or geographic uh, study area. And so what you're looking at is our two counties here. And each of these dots represent uh, an arts business. And um, in the region, just under 2,000, 1,993 businesses involved in the creation and the distribution of the arts. It's a list, folks. But look at this. Tell County, 4.4%. El Paso County, 4.6%. Remember the national average? 3.9%. So we're ahead of the national average here in terms of creative businesses. And again, we take a very conservative approach uh, to our measurements here. Uh, we don't include medical research or computer programming. Both really, you know, creative, right? Just not arts focused. Actually, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, I was sharing these data nationally with some economists uh, a while back. Uh, one of them like, okay, I can see just the arts, uh, but uh, did you include morticians in your organization? <laughs> so I was like, no, bring it, maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> and he said, are morticians actually involved in the presentation of the body? And actually using makeup and costuming and delighting. And, you know, he never looked as good alive as he does. <laughs> no, there's no morticians, you'll be glad about that. Conservative, just arts centric businesses. Um, but the point is, right here, another lens on arts and culture in this region and vibrant creative economy. Um, let me give you one other, uh, let me give you two other things real quick. Um, ready to innovate. So how does this business thing translate uh, to creativity and everything? You know, what, what, what does that mean? So the conference board, they're the national organization for big business. That's where all the big business scholars want to work and uh, spend their time. And so their research, um, business scholars, right, doing research with business leaders, their research shows creativity has soared to the top five applied skills that business leaders are looking for. It's even leapfrog the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Of course, as researchers, you may talk about that. Well, of course, you have to be able to, you know, read, write, and do math. But if you can't take some creativity and apply that to your technology or your agriculture or your engineering knowledge, those are the jobs that are being automated or headed overseas. 72% of business leaders say creativity is of high importance in hiring. 85% of those folks say we can't find the people we're looking for. Now, there's no typing test for creativity. So we asked them, well, how, how do you know if you got a creative person? You know, how do you know if you got one on the line? And there were two big indicators of creativity. Starting your own business, entrepreneurial activity, and study of the arts, especially while in college. And they write in the conclusion of their report, it's clear that the arts, music, drawing, drama, dance, you know, they spell it all out, provide skills sought by employers of the third millennium. So, for business leaders, you know, I talk about elected leaders, right? Jobs, jobs, and jobs. And yeah, everyone, business leaders are worried about the economy too. But you know, the big issue for them these days is how do we attract skilled, talented workers? Um, because if they move here, that's where the businesses go. You know, these days, you need you know, an electrical outlet, a pseudo satellite dish, you're good to go. You go to Iowa, you go to Ireland. You know, you're going to go where you can find the talent. And retaining talent is a huge issue. Uh, I've recently been in Boise and in Columbus, uh, Boise, I know, Columbus, uh, Ohio, and heard from community leaders the same exact thing. Our biggest export is highly educated young people. You know, that's, that's an economic killer. So, um, but they asked these young folks, you know, these new economy workers, um, well, what will keep you here? They said, look, you want us to be creative, innovative workers. That's who we are as people. We want to be creative in our life as well, so what are we going to do, you know, around town? What are the arts and cultural opportunities? Um, you know, where are the arts maker spaces? You know, where do we write? Where do we go and listen to music? Where do we participate? That kind of thing. So, um, the business community is really starting to understand this connection uh, between the arts and creativity and innovation. 
Uh, and so what's that actually look like, uh, what this story, 2013, let's see how you look at the fellow Thomas he's a uh, researcher at Stanford, he got the Nobel Prize for medicine, and you know, the media gave him a call, oh, Professor Stewart, you know, who was your most influential teacher? Without missing a beat, he said, it was my bassoon teacher, I would all my bassoon teacher, because that's where I learned the habits of mind that made me a great scientist, you know, perseverance, really do with ambiguity, Problem identification, you know, problem solving, that type of thing. So, um, and this connects to the importance of arts education. You know, we'll talk about that uh, shortly if we need as well. Um, but arts and helping to drive a creative economy uh, is the big takeaway on that. All right, here's the last economic slide. Uh, remember, because I, I keep expanding the uh, expanding the lens, right? We started with just a nonprofit right here in the two-county region. And then we looked at nonprofit and for-profit here in the two-county region. Well, the United States government's actually in the whole Economic Impact of the Arts Act now. In the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, the top economics shop on the planet, they study every year arts and culture across the country, anywhere they can find it. Individual artists, nonprofit, for-profit, Import, export. They count the, uh, you know, the drama department. Uh, you know, at the universities, um, anywhere where they can find economic movement. They calculate in 2014 arts and culture everything a 730 billion dollar industry in this country, 4.2 percent of the nation's GDP. That's a larger share of the economy than transportation, agriculture, tourism. And it, it completely blew people's mind at the Department of Commerce. In fact, they, they sent it back to the economists and said, do it again, this can't be right. Uh, and they came back, it was even bigger um, and, and more right. So uh, it was such a powerful story that the Secretary of Commerce you know, had the first quote in the release and talked about the importance of arts and culture and creativity and innovation and prospering in a global economy. So again, what I love about this is it adds so much uh, gravitas to the economic argument. Our message here, yeah, it's a $153 million industry, but it's part of a larger uh, industry as well. So uh, that's that's a great piece. All right, to wrap up, what you're looking at here is a picture from Paris, 1912. This is from the Louvre, and that empty space, that's where the Mona Lisa had been hanging. Um, in 1912, the Mona Lisa got stolen. It took them two years to get it back. But you know, in the time the Mona Lisa was gone, more people went to see where it had been hanging. <laughs> you know where this is going. More people went to see where it had been hanging in two years than saw the actual painting itself the previous 14 years. <laughs> you know, my point is, um, we've got to act on this all the time. We can't assume anything. We need to. We need to be making our case about the importance of the arts to us as individuals, to our communities, uh, and to the economy. And so use these data, talk to your local and state and federal elected leaders, um, and I've got to go with a little Americans for the Arts. No numbers without a story, no stories without a number. So use both. Find your story, tell a great story about your arts organization, and then remember to tell those economic benefits. Um, and tell this story again and again and again. Relentless messaging. Um, you know, we do this study every five years because, uh, you know, economies and economic models don't change that often. They only change fractionally every year. What's dynamic is our budgets, our attendance figures. So tell the story now, next year, and if you go to the uh, Kava website, you'll find the report. There's a way in there to calculate the economic impact of just your organization. Or next year, you know, I know Andy and the team will count, you know, look at all the expenditures in the region and the attendance figures, and they'll update that. And I'm sure, you know, on the trajectory, we're going to really see a lot of growth there as well. So uh, make sure you do that. Really put it to work. And go and tell that story. Now, I'm going to see your councilman several times today. I'm going to hit him with that story again and again, as well as when I see the National Association of Counties. Because you got to keep drilling the message home uh, for it to really land. So uh, no, one's, no legislator has ever come up to me and said, Okay, okay, stop talking to me about this, I get it. You know what, everybody needs to be reminded. 
So that's the story here. Uh, fabulous art story uh, for the Pikes Peak region. Arts, nonprofit arts alone, $153.3 million industry, supports 5,070 jobs in the, uh, in the region, and generates $15.9 million in government revenue. And what do you do? I tell people, you know, what do you do with an industry that provides, you know, that $153 million industry that provides quality of life and economic benefits? You nurture it, you grow it, and you invest in it. Woo! So right here in town, absolutely. Amen. Everybody talks about Denver, right? Central Agricultural Facilities District. 
I mean, everywhere I go, you know, one tenth of one percent of the sales tax, and that's really caught on a lot of places. Um, more common is use of uh, the hotel motel tax or transient occupancy tax. Everyone calls it a little something different. Where uh, you know, I'm staying at the hotel tonight, I'll pay a couple percent. It's low here, by the way. It's unbelievably. I, I can't even believe how low it is here. It's uh, like the lowest place I've ever been. Lots of room there to increase that. But because the um, arts and culture are bringing people to the town and the community and putting heads in beds, those local option taxes are a great way to do it. Um, often they're done by public referendum, and that's a big deal. You know, that's like, that's a whole campaign, but talk about the gift that keeps on giving, you know. Um, those dollars just keep coming year after year after year. So um, government, city, and county has a role, private sector, individual contributions, all part of that revenue picture. Um, but in terms of like what's most effective, if I were to drop into a community, boy, that's what I would try to get established, something like that. It's good for the community, it's good for the arts community as well. Because we're, you know what? If the, our community is not healthy, we're not healthy, right? I mean, you know, the arts and culture, we're part of this community. And what we're really talking about here, and you know, if we had another half hour, we talk about arts and healthcare and arts and education and everything else. We're talking about how do we build a healthier Pikes Peak region through the arts. So that's the, that's really important. Hey, I'm Nathan I'm with the Philharmonic here, and uh, we puzzled over uh, discerning who our comparison communities are, who our peer communities are. Is there anything deep in the report that would help us define who, who that set is? Yeah, let me give you two uh, ways to look at that. In the report, um, so remember, 341 study regions, probably not going to yourself to Chris if you thought that they're in there. Um, so uh, in, the, in the report that's on uh, Copper's website, we'll put in the numbers and we'll say, hey, here's the median, you know, for similarly populated communities in national. A population thing, that works for some folks, doesn't always work for others. What I think is the best bet is go here, registry.org slash AP5, and you'll, you'll look or see a bunch of stuff, but you'll find a thing where it's just Here's the 341 communities, the population, and top line economic impact. And then you can just go, yeah, let's compare ourselves to these five people. Because every community compares themselves to someone different, even within the community. I was in Philadelphia, the economic development people had their list of 10 cities. And like, so, you know, it's New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, LA, right, the people you'd expect. And the tourism folks were like, well, yes, and uh, here's our list of 10. And actually, there was only an overlap by five. The Philadelphia's tourism people include New Orleans on their competitors list. Like, at less than one-tenth of the population. I know where I'm headed, New Orleans. But, uh, um, so there's a lot of ways to compare. So that's really the best way to do it. What's going to be most meaningful for you. And you know the other thing on the website here? You'll find sample letters to the editors, a sample op-ed. Here's some sample tweets. There's all kinds of great tools on there how to put these data into action. You know, we want to make it as turnkey as possible for you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Libby, and I'm on the board of the Be Great Work Foundation, and yes. also a re recovering economist. Hey, and so, um, I was wondering, um, you know, you look at the um, spin-offs because of the fundamental arts activities. Have you calculated a multiplier, per se, the multiplied impact of the arts? So, is there a... And how does that look? Yeah, is there an, uh, an economic impact uh, activity multiplier? You know what, it's built into the economic impact models, but um, we actually don't really report out the data that way. Because going back to that list of U.S. Consumers, National League of Cities, all those folks, um, they're, they educate our elected and community leaders to look for jobs and government revenue figures. Because to, to come up with that, you have to do, you know, you have to do a lot more work, a lot more economic modeling. So we don't um, have just sort of a, uh, you know, you take the economic uh, activity, you know, you do a million dollars, and you know, you multiply it by 1.9 or something like that, and come up with a figure. Um, sure, our economies can suss that out uh, if needed. But you know, the other problem is with those multipliers is that they're so inflated over the years. People say, well, we use Boston's multiplier of four, which is probably twice what it actually uh, and we apply towards the, so the, so we just, we just stay away from the multiplier and things. I was thinking from the numbers you showed that it's actually a reasonable multiplier because the $35 extra that people spend mm -hmm. is not on um, direct tickets. Oh. And the, the average ticket price is probably about 30 So it's probably only about one, which oh. people would say that's reasonable. I mean, mm -hmm. 
You're absolutely right. Yeah. You said the multiplier's impact is five, but nobody yeah. believes it. It's probably like, usually it could be, I mean, it's like between one and two. So yeah. I mean, yeah, which is so. a good multiplier. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very reliable. You know, the econometric modeling, um, you know, she's asking about, uh, this input output analysis. I mean, it's been the basis of two Nobel Prizes in economics. Our methodology for this study has been vetted by the White House Council of Economic Advisors, Bank of America economists. So, yeah, we just make sure it's believable. Yeah. Uh, Randy, Brenda Stewart, the Cultural Office Board. The question I had for you you had a slide with the map of the United States and the participating communities mm -hmm. where there were different color designators. I was wondering what those were. And yeah. also, in terms of participating communities, are they actively recruited by Americans for the Arts? Do they self select? How, how do they get involved in participating in the survey? So, those little dots actually um, are uh, just slightly distinctive. Uh, so, like here, we're in a two county region. Um, some places are uh, just a city or a county. Uh, there's a couple states as part of the study. So, that's just all those significant, uh, signify uh, as part of the color dots. Um, as to who participates, we put out a call to communities uh, to participate in the study and pretty much take all comers um, and uh, we turn away nobody. There's always about 10 communities who are like, oh my god, we're dying here, we haven't got a nickel, but we need to be part of this. And so we just carry them as well. I, you know, those are the people that need it more than ever, right? So, um, you know, we don't really push it too hard. We just make sure everybody knows, everybody has an opportunity uh, uh, to do it. Um, Copper's been a great partner on this uh, uh, for several times now, and uh, uh, great results. Um, you know, there's a little uh, cost-sharing fee, uh, and uh, some sweat equity, you know, so that's what's involved uh, in doing it. Um, you know, sometimes they'll be like, North Dakota, nobody in North Dakota wants to do it, uh, so I'll go up there and, you know, plead, beg, cajole, whatever it takes, because I need to get all 50 states. It's pretty much just around the head of them. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us live for the results of Arts and Economic Prosperity Study. You can find them at culturaloffice.org.